Welcome to the Liberty Alert with Gregory Seltz, sponsored by our friends at the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty here in Washington, D.C., a program that cuts through the chaos and confusion in the culture today by talking to kingdom citizenship, bold biblical principles for a robust public Christian life. And now your host, Dr. Gregory Seltz. Good day, good day, Washington, D.C., and friends of the program all around the country. I'm Gregory Seltz. Welcome to the Liberty Alert, where every week we try to cut through the noise and take on the issues, especially the public issues that matter to people of faith. You know, we try to rely on the wisdom of the Word for the sake of the culture and the mission of the church. Or as we like to say at the LCRL, we're trying to put our temporal liberties to work for the sake of the eternal liberties of God for all. Today, the Christian's public voice. We're going to talk about that. Um, And what I mean by that is that we can be Christian in the public square. We can, you know, um, without threats of violence, without threats to one's livelihood, without threats of being deplatformed. You know, we've been talking on on some of our programs to to lawyers who are defending these cases in the public square, and now in some places uh, people can't even question uh, what what's being said in their name, and and that kind of stuff is crazy, and and so again, um, the Christian public voice, what we're saying is don't spread discouragement, spread God's encouragement, and and I, the the kind of the title for today's program was inspired uh, by a devotion that I read uh, from one of the leaders in our church. His name is Tim Hetzner, and he's the president and CEO of Lutheran Church Charities. And, and it caught my attention. You know, I get a lot of things in my mailbox every day. I'm pretty sure you do, too. And especially I try to read um, devotional material. I, uh, some people send me some, some things. It keeps me focused uh, on the Word of God in the middle of all the craziness of today. And on that particular, and then I also get political stuff, and and I see what's happening, and and my so every day there's all kinds of stuff that I need to read. Well, this one jumped out uh, at me uh, that one day. Actually, it it really blessed me, and it was October fifth, so it's a it's a, a few weeks back now, but it's appropriate for our discussion today. Um, he was focusing on an Old Testament event where the Israelites were supposed to scout the land of Cana because God had said that they were to enter that promised land, that it was it's God's promised land for them, for their descendants. And, of course, it was ultimately going to be um, the place where God sent his son. He fulfilled all of his promises to the whole world by sending the one Savior, Jesus, the Savior for all. So, you know, you think God could clear out the place for their settling and that they would be confident that whatever God wanted them to do, uh, it would be done. But there was discouragement uh, among the people, and they sent 12 spies to scout the land, and 10 of them came back and said, uh, we can't do it. So, you know, they, they saw this fruitful land. Uh, they saw how, how uh, blessed this land was. But they came back, and in, in the book of Numbers, they, uh, they said this, in Numbers 14. It said, uh, we can't go against these folks. They're stronger than we are. They, they, they spread this bad report throughout the land. And to be honest with you, God took a dim view of that perspective. He actually punished those ten. Um, you can read the story for yourself in, in Numbers 14. Uh, and there was only two guys, Joshua and Caleb, who remained uh, alive after God's punishment. And they actually said, you know, we can. God will be faithful and God will do uh, what he is supposed to do, what he has promised to do for us and through us. And so the whole point of his, his devotion was, what about you? You know, when you're facing negative circumstances, do you express doubt uh, especially when it's something that you know is in, in, in God's will for you. You know it's the right thing. You've read the scripture. You know about what God wants for his people, what God wants for, for people's lives, and you know. And so you, instead of actually putting your trust in God, um, you, you kind of look at what you think you're capable of, and a lot of times that leads to discouragement, and you spread it around. So what kind of person uh, are you going to be? An encourager? 
who takes God's promises and takes God's word to heart and puts one's trust in it, even if you don't see with your eyes what's going on that day? Or are you going to be one who's always a discourager who says it can't be done? And so he re- finally, at the end of his devotion, he said, remind yourself and even those who are discouraged that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And that's Ephesians 3.20. And I just thought, yeah, that, that was a word I needed to see and to hear that day because, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with that, especially when, when it's a clear thing, when you can see in the Scripture clear things that God wants for his people to have or clear things he wants for his people to do. Um, so that you're not just saying, you know, I want to do this and I just need God's blessing kind of thing. Um, that was an encouraging message for me in the midst of the nonsense uh, that was swirling around D.C. at the time. So I loved it. It was a, it was a great encouraging word. And I thought, you know, I, I should talk about this um, on the radio because when we're dealing with all the things we're dealing with today, and I listen to, to politics and policy positions all the time today and the the sad part about that is even politics at its best cannot save us from ourselves it cannot make the world a better place the world is a better place by people whose hearts are free and then who serve and do what is right for the sake of others that's what makes a better world and government programs don't make that kind of stuff happen uh, it's you know human beings it, it the problem with human beings is not the structures in which we live the problem with human beings is our own hearts our own sinfulness our own brokenness but we can bring those to god and there's a freedom that comes with his forgiveness with his salvation uh, with his promises and that's the whole point free people doing what is right for the sake of others that's the solution and so, you know, to me, I, you know, when I read this word about do not spread discouragement, that was a, that was a gentle reminder that even though I'm in D.C. doing the work I'm doing, um, they're not going to be the encouragement when it's all said and done. Even if D.C. functions the way it's supposed to function, the encouraging word has to come from someplace else. You know, we talk about this in my lectures, and I've been traveling around. A lot of you have invited me to come to your churches lately. It's been a real blessing. I'm actually kind of tired uh, right now because I've been literally all over the country and talking about the freedoms we have in this country and talking about how our founding fathers set up the polity of this country. And one of the ways they did that was that they actually bound the government because they didn't see the government as the place where the solutions Uh, to our problems and the solutions uh, to our culture resided. So they bound the government and they set the religiously motivated, self-disciplined and self-disciplining citizen, uh, self-governing citizen free to do what was right for the sake of others. And so I thought, wow, you know, this is a great reminder that we've been given a blessing in the culture in which we live. And if you're a Christian then you have a real, uh, as a Christian citizen in this country, you have a real role to play because you bring an encouraging word. But as soon as I read that, I thought, you know, I bet you a lot of people are going to hear what I'm saying and say, but how can we not be discouraged? When the culture now is so rapidly, in so many ways, anti-Christian in ways that it has never been before. You know, whether it's the media, whether it's our entertainment, whether it's our educational system or our political system, the Judeo-Christian view is under attack. There's no doubt about that. Anybody who says that's not true, it's just silly. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming um, that the structures now of our country have have turned, if you will. They're 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 much more. uh, They're even calling the church. Uh, in some circles, they're calling it kind of the enemy of the state. Um, I, I've read you that Robert Reich quote about you know the, the the battle between the modernists and the pre-modernists, and he thinks of us as the pre-modernists. He thinks that terrorism is a bad thing, but really the church, the pre-modernists, are really the real problem because he's a secular progressive. He's a secular pietist, and that's where the future, at least from his point of view, lies. 
uh, not from what I see happening in our country today, when, when I see people who really just believe that they're the authority in their own lives. So how can you not but be discouraged because this Judeo-Christian worldview, the, uh, the, 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 the view of male-female from the Scripture, the view of marriage from the Scripture, the view of the proper expression of sex and intimacy from the Scripture, it's not just out of date it's out of, and out of style. It's now being considered hate speech because it offends some people and people are politicizing these conscience differences. You know, when did our culture, for instance, decide that the Ten Commandments or hate speech. And so, you know, even the golden rule is being demonized in some quarters. And, and you know, Christians, uh, are you just going to sit back and let God's moral voice be legislated out of existence? And then the question is, would that be a good thing? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, you, you go back even into the scriptures and you see the book of Judges and it said, in that time, people did what, they, what was right in their own eyes. And it was a terrible time in the history of Israel, but it, those kind of things are terrible times in whatever uh, history or whatever country they're practiced. You know, so the times that we live in, I mean, think of some of the things that have been cheered on lately. Legislatures cheering legislation, allowing um, people to willfully kill children in the womb up till and uh, the ninth month and even beyond if the baby's born alive and was supposed to be boarded. Uh, aborted. I mean, uh, Caesar's gone rogue, man. I mean, the culture's gone insane, if that's, if that's what you think. Officials have, were demoting the church amidst the, you know, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. You know, most crises in American history, people went back to church to pray because their spiritual demeanor and their spiritual health was the key to overcoming whatever was against us. We were willfully being told uh, that's not even as important as keeping the bars open or that's not even as important as keeping um, liquor stores open and casinos open. It's crazy. Government agencies are even standing against clear moral teachings of the Bible. And what I mean by that is they're, they're saying that you cannot disagree with them. Uh, so, I, you know, they're saying that men are not men and women are not women and people are only what they say they are, irrespective of God's moral ordering of the world. People have always said that down through time. I get that. But when you, when you actually weaponize the state to uh, crush any disagreement with that, no. The church, at its best, has always been the moral voice uh, of the culture for all people. And that's a role that we have to play even for the sake of those who do not uh, join join us on Sundays. It's crazy today when one of the platforms of of one political party today, in, in the freest country still in the world, literally targets the church because of its moral teachings, you know, seeking to legislate it into submission. And then the other party... Um, when faced with the opportunity to defend or protect the church properly against such attacks, it shrinks back too. So, you know, again, when people say, well, don't be a discourager, how can you not be? Well, what I'm saying today is, and again, going back to this devotional thought, yeah, concerned for sure, aware, absolutely, but discouraged, no. Because, you know, coming up this month is what's called Christ the King Sunday. So the Christ who died on the cross and rose again is coming back to judge the living and the dead, and all history is moving towards that day, purposefully, okay? Where we will see with our eyes what we already know is true by faith. So we are already living in the victory, but it's a victory that is by grace through faith in Christ, and someday we'll see it. And that Christ the King Sunday, you know, it, it, it still proclaims that even now it is finished. Every Sunday uh, we profess that he's coming back and he's going to judge the living and the dead. So even now that is true. And the only problem is right now it feels like more like Good Friday all over again, you know. Um, but remember the cross, remember the tomb, it couldn't contain the crucified Lord Jesus. And Friday gave way to Easter Sunday. And all that we're struggling with today will finally give way to Christ's return. So again, that's what I'm saying. Um, Concerned, yes. Aware, yes. 
Uh, do we have to engage these things? Yes. Can we push back on some of these things? Yes. Because we don't want things to get worse. Remember, we've always said this, uh, good politics cannot save us, but bad politics can destroy us. And so we're really trying to work very hard uh, to make sure that we don't participate in terrible politics, which can make life pretty miserable this side of heaven. So that's why um, our words, if we're going to be a Christian public voice, they have to reflect and proclaim his word. And God's word, by definition, is an encouraging word. So when God says no, that's an encouraging word, because he says no out of love. When God says yes, uh, his gracious word, that too is out of love. But God's no, God's yes on God's terms. We as Christians, that's by definition what we mean by not being people of discouragement, but all but being people of God's encouragement in the world in which we live. So what do we do? Um, we can speak the truth in love. And, and again, that flies in the face of kind of what's going on in our culture today, because people... Uh, you know, I, I hear over and over again that I just want to do whatever I want. Well, that's that's not what you were called to be. That's not what you were created to be. Human beings were created to do what was right for others. Um, I don't want to get into the whole idea of well, where did sin come from? What's this rebellion? Why is it a broken world? But we weren't created to just do whatever we want. We were created to be a reflection of God's moral uh, voice in the world. That everyone's born with a conscience. And so this idea of just doing whatever I want, this, that, that's by definition what sin is. <laughs> you know, that's what's so funny. People think that the church focuses, you know, on all these sins we really don't. We think of sins as just a manifestation of a bigger problem. Uh, sin, capital S. So it's kind of like we're not going to focus on whether you got a cough, whether you got a fever, whether you got. No, we want to focus on the virus. We want to focus on that which is the deeper issue in you. And the Bible calls the deepest issue sin. Um, our own rebellion, our, our being turned in on ourselves, and not, not looking to God and not looking to neighbor. You know, we're free to do what's right. We're free to do to be faithful. We're free to serve others in, in Christ the way that God in Christ serves us. So if the church is going to be a voice, that's the encouraging voice it needs to be. Um, the first thing we've got to do is defend that God's Ten Commandments. We've got to defend that that's an even encouraging word. I know those are God's no, you know, they were, were God limits or directs or disciplines even calls to repentance through that word, but that is an encouraging word in the fact that it draws you, it, it, it refocuses you um, towards God. And so, again, defending those is actually seeking um, to, to bring an encouraging word to people. You know, when you think about God's Ten Commandments, it, it's a preserving word, it directs the conscience, and it even calls one to repentance when those words are violated. And, you know, there's, there are some things we should not be doing. The only question is, who is the one that sets those standards? I hate to say it, but more and more politicians think they're the ones that set these standards, and that is a misuse um, of their office. They're not the moral voice uh, of the culture. Uh, they're the ones, they're kind of the referees. They set the, the bare minimum standards and they make sure that they apply to all. That's, that's their main role. But when they start taking over and playing the game and, and making up the rules and, 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 and choosing who wins and who loses and all these kind of things, uh, they're way out of bounds. And then, of course, the, port, the, of course, the postmodern world says each one does what's right in their own eyes. And again, the Bible says that doesn't make it right. Um, so, you know, that's one of the reasons I think the superhero movies, you know, they've just kind of lost their mojo because it's almost like there's no point to them anymore, you know? So we proclaim the God who created, ordered, and owns the world, and that's an encouraging word too. So we're going to talk about the dignity of the family. It's more than a relationship. It's an institution where civilizing and hum humanizing things happen. Society is founded on healthy families, the sanctity of life, that every life has a dignity that we need to honor, um, the purpose of fidelity. You know, uh, 
this whole notion that sex is just like a, it's like something to do on the weekend. It's missing the whole point of the fact that people were meant to have intimacy with one another and, and to be able to have courage and, and to care for one another in an age of vulgarness. Um, the purpose of property. Uh, you, were, you were meant to be a steward of things and, and, and work and, and earning things and having things so that you could also give it away. Um, that's what, there, there's a greater purpose to all this. The honoring of one's name. I mean, that's one of the things our culture has just completely given that up. We can't wait to disparage people's names. Um, and then, of course, then the proper understanding that all gifts come from God. And he gives things freely and differently to people. So coveting somebody else's stuff is never a, a winning proposition. So, you know, the battle today is not about politics, e- economics, or culture. The battle really is for the soul of folks and, and for what it means to be truly human. And the Bible is actually very clear. The, the problem in our world, the problem in the human heart, it's worse than you could have ever imagined. But because of God's work in the world, by grace through faith in Christ, uh, his solution's even better than you could have envisioned either. You know, so um, we just want freedom. You know, one of the things, we want freedom to be a different voice in the world. We want to be God's uh, unique voice in the world for the sake of others. And so, you know, we humbly and courageously, we need to learn how to, uh, to speak God's truth in love. We need to learn how to differentiate his saving work from his preserving work, but to actually be useful to both of those works as we develop our public voice for others. We've got to speak boldly of his creating and ordering world. Um, we've got to differentiate the work of the state from the work of the church so that each one can do what God intended them. And folks, I hate to tell you this, but the state is not the most important one. Um, the, the most important one is the church and its work, or at least if you're not a church member, at least the the work of free people serving and caring for others. Um, you know, we, we need to remind ourselves again and again that in a healthy society, we don't put our trust in princes, politicians, and magistrates, even though we honor their work of curbing our worst outward behavior. Um, but we put our faith in, in, you know, especially in the God who frees us to serve one another uh, in love. And that's, that's got to be the solution as we deal with the things that we face. And then finally, we can strive you know, to fulfill our vocations and service to others as God himself serves us. I love what Cal Thomas, I love reading Cal Thomas. Um, he's, you know, he's a political commentator, I know that, but he's a man of faith, and there's a lot of times when he says things about as clearly as you can say them. And I love what he was talking about. He said, in an era of political correctness, virtue signaling, and wokeness, wisdom is in such short supply that when discovered, it stands out like a beacon in a storm. And, and to that end, I'm saying to you, if you're a, a disciple of Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, that's what you can be in this craziness today. If you speak God's word, you speak God's no and God's yes on God's terms, uh, you are going to stand out. Now, in the world in which we live, we see that standing out isn't always a good thing. I mean, you can get run over by the state. You can see what's happening with some of our friends who are standing up for their conscience rights in this country today. They're being punished. But you do stand up uh, like a beacon in a storm, and people eventually begin to see through the haze. They begin to see through the storm, and they're looking for that light. And so that's why we while we might be uh, aware of what's going on, we might be concerned about what's going on, we're not going to be discouraged because we know that God is already in the middle of this preserving and saving, and we can be a voice, uh, a beacon of light, as it were, uh, in the middle of all this. And so he talked about wisdom. He said we should become people of wisdom. And he said, don't equate wisdom with information. I think that's the biggest problem I have with Google and technology and all these things. You know, as long as we just have lots of information, that's not true. Because if your heart is corrupt, you just are going to manipulate that information towards your own ends. And that's the definition of, of, uh, of sin. That's the definition of brokenness. So just having access to lots and lots of information doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be solutions. 
And then he talks about how Scripture is full of wisdom, but as church attendance declines and denominations across uh, the theological uh, spectrum lose members, uh, the the font of ancient wisdom is is not a primary source now for many Americans. And he's right. So especially if you're a Christian, get back to church. Create the habit of getting back to church. You can't replace church with online, being there in person, studying the Word of God with other people, uh, not just hearing sermons. I mean, going to Bible study, going to worship and Bible study, and really you know, making the Bible, uh, make it your own by how you read it and how you pray through it. You're going to become a wise person. Now, he says, so what is wisdom? He said, wisdom is the knowledge of what is true, or right. So it's not just information, it's knowing what is right and having a moral framework for that information uh, coupled with just judgment in action. And so wisdom is something uh, that we learn and we put to, to work. Now he points out that he thinks, you know, kind of the secular pietism uh, with all of its uh, blasphemy laws coming and its woke. Uh, uh, culture and its cancel culture. He thinks that's a dying thing. I hope he's right because right now m- almost all of our institutions are overrun with it. Um, but he's saying a, a people of wisdom, not only will they be able to make it through this, um, but they can also be uh, a very positive voice for the sake of culture if they're willing to stand up for what is right. So to me, that, that to me is the Christ the King perspective. And like I said, coming up uh, this month in churches all across the country is going to be what's called the final Sunday of the church year. I don't know if you knew this, but the church year is different than, so it's not, you know, New Year's uh, is not the 1st of January for the church. Uh, it's the, the uh, first Sunday of Advent is the new year in the church year. And the, the Sunday before that first Sunday of Advent, that's called Christ the King Sunday. And that's giving you a perspective from the one who lived and died and rose again and said, I'm coming back to judge the living and the dead. So I think it's going to take humility because this is not our voice. This is the Bible's voice. This is God's voice through the scripture. And it's going to take courage to actually be that voice in our culture because if it does stand out, we're finding out today uh, that it can oftentimes stand out and it's not always a positive thing at the moment for the one who speaks it, but it's a positive thing ultimately for the sake of others. So again, um, this is our role, to be voices of encouragement in times of real despair. So just putting it simply, we're to be people of God's no, people of God's yes, people of God's law and his gospel on God's loving terms, because that's what all of us need. And so I hope you take up the challenge to be that voice of encouragement today. Thanks for tuning in today. To get to know our LCRL DC work better, check out our website at lcrlfreedom.org. Contained there are resources to empower your public square dynamic discipleship. Or check out our weekly Word from the Center opinion piece every Friday at facebook.com forward slash LCRL Freedom. Till next time, God bless you always. I'm Gregory Seltz. Have a great week. You've been listening to Liberty Alert with Dr. Gregory Seltz, Executive Director of the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. This program has been brought to you by the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty.